Welcome, everyone, to the 11th episode of the Baptizing Philosophy podcast. Today, I am joined by Dr. David Bradshaw. He is a professor at the University of Kentucky and the author of Aristotle East and West. This is a fantastic book on um, Aristotle, of course, and uh, Orthodox theology. It's basically a must read if you're trying to get deep into um, Orthodox theology. But uh, today, we're here to actually talk about the orthodox theology of time. This is something that I've talked about a bit on this channel. I've done some videos on Demetrius Staniloy. I think he has some fantastic stuff on the theology of time from an orthodox perspective. But um, it's actually kind of hard to find uh, discussions and, and stuff on YouTube specifically that are talking about the orthodox theology of time. So I thought I'd have Dr. Bradshaw on because he's written a paper called um, A Christian Approach to the Philosophy of Time. Um, an alternative title to that is um, Time and Eternity in the Greek Fathers, I believe. So um, I'll leave a link to that paper in the description. But um, yeah, thanks for your time, Dr. Bradshaw. And um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, well, thank you. It's great to be here. And I I agree that um, time and eternity uh, isn't really given the attention that it deserves, at least by Orthodox. It's a huge issue in philosophy of religion. Um, and so anyone who's kind of coming from that direction will know about a lot of the things that are debated. But Orthodox, I think, really haven't uh, dived into it the way that we should. Um, just uh, for what it's worth, so the paper you mentioned, the one called A Christian Approach to the Philosophy of Time, um, that's on my academia website. And that's a shorter version. That's sort of a summary of the longer paper, uh, Time and Eternity mm -hmm. in the Greek Fathers. But I'd actually recommend the shorter version because it's a lot simpler and clearer uh, without all the historical detail. But anyway, um, yeah, glad to be here. All right. Um, yeah. So in that paper, um, you begin by saying that there's there seems to be a distinction between the way most Eastern fathers will talk about time and the way Western philosophy um, has typically understood time and specifically eternity and God's eternity. Um, so from what I understand, the Eastern fathers tended to see eternity as, um, as Maximus said uh, somewhere, I believe that it's something around God, one of the things around God. So it's not directly identical to the essence of God. While the Western fathers and philosophers, especially later on, like uh, Thomas Aquinas in particular, he seems to identify eternity with the essence of God itself. And this relates to his conception of divine simplicity. Um, so I'm just wondering, how do Orthodox Christians understand God's God's eternity specifically? And um, do we speak of God's eternity as an energy or as something um, or as identical to his essence? And how does it how can we distinguish it from the Latin approach to God's eternity? Yeah, uh, right. So just to give the context, uh, what I do in that longer paper, I actually start with Plotinus. And Plotinus, I think, is really helpful for understanding where both traditions are, are sort of coming from, but and also how they diverge. Um, in Plotinus, you have the three hypostases, the one, intellect, and soul. And intellect, nous in Greek, is essentially Plotinus's version of Aristotle's prime mover, uh, that who practices self-thinking thought. I mean, not the aspect of causing motion as much, but the idea of an eternal divine intellect that's pure act, pure energia, um, not involved in any kind of temporal process or coming to be, always fully actual. Um, that's what Plotinus takes on board. But whereas for Aristotle, that had been God, the highest reality for Plotinus, it's the second hypostasis after the one, uh, which is a, a, an idea and a term that he's getting more from Plato uh, particularly probably the first hypothesis of the Parmenides and sort of synthesizing that with what Plato says about the form of the good and the Republic. So the one or the good, those are both different names he uses. Uh, the key point is that um, just as in Aristotle, the prime mover, because it is pure act, is eternal in the sense of not being subject to any change or temporal process. Um, that's true for intellect as well. And Plotinus says that eternity is the life of intellect. Um, it, you know, all three of these hypostases, they're not sort of just 
uh, abstract entities. They're living realities for Plotinus. So eternity is the life of intellect. Uh, time is the life of soul, the third apostasis. So he's following there Plato and the Timaeus. Uh, and in his system, soul is the image and the expression, the sort of the outward expression of intellect uh, as it emanates from intellect. And he's uh, so their relationship is a lot like what Platina, uh, Plato says rather than the Timaeus, where time is the moving image of eternity. So you have eternity is the life of intellect, time is the life of soul, but the one is beyond both of those as their source. Hmm. Okay, the one is no more eternal than it is temporal. Neither one of those attributes can be applied to the one uh, directly and properly. At the most, you could say that eternity and time both pre-exist within the one as all things pre-exist within the one because all things come forth from the one. So that's the basic Neoplatonic idea that any effect uh, pre-exists in a higher mode within its cause. So um, you have this structure in which eternity is not a uh, characteristic of the highest reality. It's characteristic of the second hypostasis. Uh, well, when you read Augustine, uh, particularly book eight, chapter six of the city of God is a really helpful chapter for this. He says that um, the Neoplatonists essentially got right what they said about intellect. And that as Augustine sees it, most of what they say about intellect is a legitimate description of God. Um, and uh, he says very little about the one. You know, and in fact, the whole apophaticism of Plotinus, the idea that the one is not only beyond intellect, it's beyond being, um, it has no name, just as Plotinus, or Plato rather says about the first hypothesis of the Parmenides, that the one that does not partake of being has no name. There's nothing you can, no positive description you can give of it other than to say what it is not. Um, well, Plotinus takes all that as a description of the one. Uh, Augustine kind of brushes that aside, rarely even mentions that whole apophatic dimension of Plotinus. Instead, he appropriates the Platinian description of intellect. Um, and one consequence of that, I think it fits very nicely with his, his understanding of divine simplicity. That's probably why he does appropriate it in the way he does. But anyway, one consequence, you know, for Augustine, because of divine simplicity, um, uh, any intrinsic attribute of God, whether it's a life or wisdom or power or goodness, is just a different way of naming the divine essence or essentia. And that's true of intellect, or excuse me, of eternity as well. And he says this explicitly, that eternity is the very substance of God. Uh, I, I quote that passage in my paper. Um, so that becomes definitive for the whole Western Christian tradition. You can find almost identical statements in Boethius, uh, then later in Anselm, uh, Bonaventure, uh, Aquinas, and even Scotus. You know, as much as they differ on a lot of other issues, they all take this view of eternity in which it's um, uh, a, a different way of understanding or naming the essence of God. Uh, time then is, is simply a creature. Um, and it's a feature of created reality, but there's nothing, uh, no way in which you could speak of God himself as temporal. Um, and scholars have noticed how this actually creates a, a, an important challenge and maybe a problem for Western scholastic theology. Um, how are time and eternity related to each other? Hmm. Okay. You know, back in Plato, time was the moving image of eternity. You had a kind of genetic relationship between them. And that was true in Plotinus as well. Well, Augustine, by sort of severing uh, eternity and time from their context within, uh, in, in relation to the one, he's moved that, he's removed that relationship. Um, and so time is just a sort of a created reality, didn't have to exist. There's no um, a way in which it's sort of intrinsic to the Godhead. And so, um, uh, you know, one thing I argue in that paper, the short one, actually, the Christian philosophy of, approach to the philosophy of time, is that this has had uh, effects in shaping the way that Western philosophers think about time and eternity right up to the present day. 
including uh, those who are not Christians, don't believe in God, they still think of time and eternity as sort of separate and disjoint realities, so to speak. And you have to pick one as, as the one that's really real. Um, and the other one then as is going to be a sort of an epiphenomenon or somehow a construction, uh, a mental construction, you know, the, uh, the B theory of time in which um, you have what people sometimes refer to as the block universe and um, our, our perception of, of temporal passage is simply an aspect of our own experience, but not true of reality itself. Um, everything that ever has happened or ever will happen is all equally real and present within that one block. Uh, you have that view and then sort of opposed to that, you have the view called presentism in which only the present moment is real and nothing else is and either past or future. Um, so it seems to me intuitively, neither one of those is very satisfactory. And the, the challenge is how do you um, find or, or preserve what's true in both of them and uh, find a, a synthesis, maybe not, a, that's not the right word, but just a, a different way of thinking that escapes that dichotomy. And that's what I argue is present in the Greek fathers. So the other part, I'm sorry, I'm taking a long time. But the other part of your question was, so what is the view that the Greek fathers have? Um, well, again, if you go back to Plotinus, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Dion, what I argue is that Dionysius, the Areopagite, um, uh, treats both time and eternity as divine processions. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you, uh, the divine processions are, uh, you know, in the divine names by Dionysius, chapter four, he begins with the first of the divine processions, which is uh, goodness, or another name for that, also beauty, uh, kalos, um, and um, also love, okay? <laughs> both He uses both eros and agape. So he has a long chapter on there, on that first procession, beauty, goodness, love. Then chapter five is the, the second procession, being. And then, um, uh, let's see, so chapter six, I guess, is life, and chapter seven, wisdom or knowledge, um, and so forth. So there are a lot of divine processions, um, and he treats of time and eternity primarily in chapter 10. And he says about them the same thing that he says about all the processions, that God is these, you know, just as you can say God is being itself, God is life itself, God is, God is wisdom itself. You can say God is eternity. And you can also say God is time. And he says both of those, and he doesn't sort of privilege one of the other. He doesn't say God is really eternity and, you know, we just experience him as time or anything like that. He says, no, God is time. Uh, but then he also says God transcends both eternity and time because he is their source. And that too is true of all the divine processions, being, goodness, life, wisdom. God transcends them all as their source. Uh, and if you know his other work, the mystical theology, in chapter five, that's where he says that all these names of God being life and wisdom uh, have to be uh, not only affirmed, but also negated. God is not being, God is not life, God is not wisdom, God is not goodness. He negates all of those in chapter five, mystical theology. Um, well, what he's doing is really sort of adapting and transforming the whole framework of Plotinus as a description of the Christian God. And what Plotinus had treated as separate, uh, applying to separate hypostases, the one and intellect, and even soul, um, Dionysius pulls together as different ways of describing the one God. Okay, so God is eternity itself, God is life itself, but God is also beyond both eternity and life, or excuse me, I said life, I meant, I meant time, beyond both eternity and time as their source. Um, and like I said, that's characteristic of all the divine processions and um, uh, so what happens later, particularly with uh, St. Gregory Palamas, uh, Palamas takes a lot of what Dionysius says about the divine processions and sort of rephrases it in terms of the divine energies. And uh, as you know, in my book, in chapter nine, I, I discuss Palamas and how really what he does is to synthesize and to bring together 
a lot of topics that the earlier fathers had discussed, often using different terminology. And Dionysius, the key term is procession, right? And you also have this other term, the things around God, that's used a lot by the Cappadocian fathers. And you mentioned that for them, eternity is one of the things around God. Well, so Palamas takes both the processions and the things around God, and he understands them to be uh, different forms of the divine energy. So I think ultimately your answer to your question is yes, that eternity is a divine energy and so is time. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, um, you know, one reason that's important is that that means our, our life within time is a, already a way of participating in the divine life. Now, uh, there's much more, you know, not, not that that doesn't mean every, any, everything we do in time is good, obviously, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, temporality itself is very good. It's something blessed, you might say. It's an activity that God performs that manifests his nature. Um, and so um, because of that, we think of temporality itself, uh, I think, in a different way than has been characteristic of, of the West. Um, all right. So just uh, threw a lot at you there, but I hope that, that gives you the basic idea. Yeah. Yeah. That was fantastic. And um, maybe to begin, I, I think that if we're understanding both um, eternity and time as a divine procession or a divine energy, um, then we don't, it's harder to fall into a sort of dichotomy that you see more in the West between eternity and time. Um, but I guess this question is probably more just to clarify what we mean by the divine energies. I think this is a more fundamental question about that. Um, and, and that is, so if we're saying that both eternity and time is a divine energy, um, from my understanding, the divine energies are, um, at least the ones that aren't associated specifically with creation, like love and being and wisdom, these are also eternal. So is there is there a sense in which, um, and then they wouldn't be, at least within the Godhead, they wouldn't be temporal. So is there a sense in which we have to still make some sort of distinction, um, not just in terms of, yes, they're distinct, like they're just different, but like almost in like, for lack of a better term, like a uh, qualitative distinction between the divine energy of eternity and the divine energy of time, because there seems to eternity seems to have a unique unique relationship with God in the sense that God is eternal, and there is a sense in which God is uniquely eternal in a way that He is not temporal, at least in the way we are temporal. So, um, yeah, do do you? Um, and also, one one more question on that, which I think is related. Um, um. If God's energy is eternal, then we also have to say that I, I believe the other energies are also eternal. So I guess this is also a more fundamental question about the divine energies and how they, I guess, relate or like perhaps even mutually penetrate each other so that you can have being, which is and life and wisdom, which are distinct from eternity, yet there's yet they're also eternal. So that's a more fundamental question on the nature of the divine energies and how they interrelate and um, yeah, perhaps, yeah, mutually penetrate each other. Um, and then the, the first question was about the difference between eternity and time and how we have to understand these energies in relation to the Godhead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so just to take the second question first. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right that the, the energies do... Uh, you could say inter interpenetrate or uh, maybe participate in one another. Um, so life has being, right? Mm -hmm. um, and wisdom, you might say, is a form of life. It's a particular form of life that is only possible for rational creatures. Um, and both being and life and wisdom are, are all good. So um, they all, you could say, uh, you could say either they participate in the uh, the first divine procession, which is goodness, or or that um, they're forms of goodness, perhaps if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, um, so yeah, as I think of it, this is kind of analogous to what Plato says about the weaving of the forms back in the Sophist. You know, he comes to this really crucial insight in his philosophy that whereas in the middle dialogues like the symposium and the Republic, he seemed to have treated 
uh, each form sort of itself by itself with itself. You know, that's the phrase he uses in the mm -hmm. symposium as, as sort of a distinct uh, independent reality in the sophist. He comes to realize, no, that, um, you know, he treats what he calls the five greatest kinds, which are being sameness and difference and motion and rest. And he says, well, being is different from motion. So being partakes of difference but being is the same as itself. So it partakes of sameness and uh, sameness has being and so does difference, right? So they partake of being. So there's sort of the reciprocal interweaving uh, of the forms. So something similar among the processions, uh, although they do have a distinct order, at least the way Dionysius puts them. Um, so as to your first question about time in particular, uh, yeah, you're right there as well, that time is, linked to creation in a way that eternity is not. Um, and um, there's a passage in John Scythopoulos, who was the, the first great commentator on Dionysius. He wrote Scolia on uh, the Dionysian corpus. And let me just read a few sentences here that I quote in the paper. Uh, so this is John Scythopoulos. He says, thus also time being once at rest in he who always is God, shown forth in its descent when later it was necessary for visible nature to come forth. In other words, at, in the act of creation. So the procession, and that's the same term Dionysius uses, the proodos, the procession of the goodness of God in creating sensible objects we call time. Okay, so it's a kind of procession, but it's a procession that only comes forth in the act of creation. And that's unlike the uh, procession of eternity, which is uh, the divine life, right? Or, or mm -hmm. characteristic of God, even independently of creating. Uh, but nonetheless, see the thing that's important here, um, even though it comes forth in the act of creating, it is a divine procession. And um, it was once at rest in he who always is. Okay. Uh, and then it's shown forth uh, when, uh, when creation occurred. So uh, it was all, it was sort of implicit within God already. And um, I think what he's doing here is adapting the idea from Plotinus that Plotinus in turn gets from Plato and the Timaeus. You know, where Plato says time is the moving image of eternity. The time is the, a kind of an unfolding of what eternity is altogether all at once. Um, so, and that, like I said, that, that, that's the intrinsic genetic relationship they have to each other, even though time in its manifest form uh, is only uh, a concomitant of creation. And, and of course, creation is something God chooses to do, right? It didn't have to exist. So in that sense, time is not necessary in the same way that eternity is. Right. Yeah. And I think that um, Father Demetrius Staniloy in his essay, Eternity and Time, I'm not sure if you had a, a chance to read it, but um, uh, just for the audience, the way he understands time, I think really um, um, provides a good explanation for what you were saying about how time isn't a bad thing the way um, uh, like the Gnostics thought and other forms of um, – other groups uh, that aren't Christian, but um, time is an image of eternity. And for Staniloy, it's an image of eternity in the precise sense that for him, time is the interval of waiting between acts of love or movement towards another person. Um, it's a personal reality for him in, in particular. And um, eternity is beyond time, not as like some sort of negation of time. So you don't get that dichotomy between eternity and time, but it's actually the fullness of time that transcends time because in eternity, in God's eternity, the movement of each of the divine persons towards each other has no distance. So there's no interval of waiting. And therefore it's like this immediate, um, this immediate presence of each of the divine persons um, 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 in this perichoretic relationship um and that's etern god's eternity and then we are called by god to enter into these into this um eternity through becoming closer and closer and closer to him which is deification um so and this is how like what you were saying about how time is fundamentally good but that doesn't mean everything that we do in time is good and what's how staniloy explains this is that um when we sin 
um, if we're understanding time as this communion, this movement towards another person, sin is actually the movement away from the other person. It's like uh, the selfishness or pride. And this pride is actually, it occurs in time, but actually in its um, essence, if you can even speak of sin as having an essence, but what it is, it's a motion that negates time because instead of moving towards another, it's actually this movement towards the self. It's what um, Maximus, the confessor calls um, self-love. So I'm just wondering um, if um, uh, what you think about this understanding that Stanilo has, because I'm not sure if I I haven't read as many as uh, um, of the patristic writers as as you have. But um, do you do you see this in the earlier fathers or is it uh, perhaps implicit in their understanding? Because I think that Stanilo specifically adds this. Um, I guess more of a personal personalistic aspect to it, which really, in my mind, really clarifies how we understand eternity because it is this communion of the persons in that uh, the immediate relationship of the Trinity. Um, and I think it's just a really elegant um, um, way of understanding eternity and time. So I'm just wondering what your um, what your thoughts on it are. Yeah, yeah, I did read most of that article um, just last night, and uh, I was also very impressed. I thought. Um, you know, he's so uh, simple and clear, but also very yeah. profound. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, Father Steneloi is is almost like a modern father um, in not only his learning, but also his witness for the faith. He spent five years in a communist prison camp in Romania and just lived in, under horrible conditions where persecution mm-hmm. was always there in some form. Um, and he, he sort of... Uh, brought the light of orthodoxy or the orthodox tradition into that horrible communist uh, setting. So um, I do think it's, it's at least, you know, what he says about the Trinity um, is maybe at least implicit in the fathers. Um, They don't ever connect uh, the communion of the persons to the subject of eternity in quite the way that he does. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, they definitely do say that uh, eternity, the life of God, is without interval, diastema. Uh, that's a major theme because mm-hmm. that was part of the rejection of Arianism in the fourth century. Right. Um, and they also say, you know, in the Trinitarian theology, that there's no difference of will or knowledge or uh, goodness or activity, energia. Um, among the three persons. And that also is a major theme. You know, you can find that in Athanasius as well, and certainly the Cappadocians. Mm. Um, But um, I just don't recall anywhere where they sort of use that close communion of the persons to get at what eternity is. Right. Um, But I do think it's a perfectly consistent uh, and really very insightful, you know. So I jotted down a few passages or a few sentences uh, he says, there's no fullness of life without fullness of communion. Mm-hmm. Um, and because there's God is the fullness of life, therefore, uh, there must be perfect communion in God. And of course, that's the communion of the persons of the Trinity. And so um, uh, this communion then, you know, that that's perfect among the three persons is what God wants to offer us to sort of invite us to share, but we're creatures. And so inevitably, because we're creatures, there is interval uh, both between us or among us as creatures and between us and God. And that's how time is a kind of, you know, I think this is very compatible with what I was saying a minute ago about time being the unfolding of eternity Mm -hmm. that time is what eternity is in the way that's suitable for creatures Mm -hmm. in the way that we as creatures are capable of of living within but at the same time because it's an invitation to communion um it's it's sort of also the arena in which we transcend time Mm -hmm. and come to participate in eternity um so yeah i think that's it's very profound um and also you know if you if anyone um knows this essay i think it's just called time and eternity right under eternity his, eternity in time yeah eternity in time yeah, yeah. it's a publishes a little booklet um anyway yeah it, it's it's a very simple straightforward reading um not unlike mine not a lot of footnotes so um yeah but i was i was i thought it was totally compatible with with what what i found okay yeah that's that's good to know um something uh 
something that um, is mentioned by Seniloy and uh, yourself, maybe actually, maybe not in that essay, but I know Seniloy has a very similar passage in volume one of the experience of God, um, not passage, a, a whole chapter. And I believe there's a section talking about time and eternity in that um, in that book. Um, and he basically says the exact same thing. And um, and I believe he talks about angels there. I may be wrong. I know he talks about angels and demons somewhere. Um, and you'd also talk about angelic time in your um, in your essay. And um, I, I have a quote here that you say they don't have the knife edge present of temporal succession um, and that they have no need of memory because in their ever moving rest, the present good, um, despite moving more and more into you could say a continual newness. Um, Stanilor says this as, as well about um, about theosis, but um, the present good, so every new good they have contains the past good in totality while transcending it. And this is like the ever moving rest, right? Um, so I was wondering if we could talk about angelic time and maybe um, also if you are um if you have any thoughts on this as well um demonic time as well because i think what stanilo would say is that well for angels since angels are created into eternity from my understanding they're sort of created in the direct presence of god unlike mankind uh we we slowly move and mature towards god but angels are created fully matured and then they sort of have one choice are you to choose the good and to choose evil in sort of this full knowledge or full experience of god so when um when there is this choice of evil, there is a basically for the for an angel, uh, a, a demon. There is this full withdrawal out away from communion, and then a full, as Stanilo would understand, this negation of eternity or this movement into an eternity, which is, uh, and this is what I think is brilliant about Stanilo's understanding, um, the eternity of heaven, so angelic eternity, and then the eternity of demons are both. Eternal, so the eternity of hell, they're both eternal, but they're eternal in exact opposite ways. So they're not symmetrical eternities because the eternity of heaven is eternal because in time as this um, interval of communion has been transcended as perfect love or full communion. So there's no need, there's no time there. But hell, there is no time because there is no love at all. There's no movement out of the self. Um, so yeah, may, maybe we could talk a bit about um, angelic time as you describe it in in the essay and what the fathers say about angelic time. And if you have any thoughts also on demonic time or um, hell, time in hell and stuff and how we understand the eternity of hell versus the um, eternity of heaven. Yeah, I have to admit, so I didn't quite finish the Stenolo essay and maybe, maybe the part about demons was more at the very end. Um, but so far as the angels go, uh, this this is something that the fathers have a good bit to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you said, uh, it's Gregor of Nyssa in his homilies on the Song of Songs has a passage about how the angels are eternally progressing further into the good, which is God. And this is his famous idea of perpetual progress. Uh, but the way he applies it to the angels in particular is he says that they have no need of memory because the good that was present to them before remains always present. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, it's an eternal growth. You can almost picture it, you know, like in geometry, if you start with a point and extend it in an array, it's an eternally uh, or ever increasing ray that remains, the whole thing is lit up. The whole thing is sort of present to their consciousness all at once. Mm -hmm. um, whereas our experience of time is just a point, you know, the present moment. And so uh, that's that's a fundamental way in which the time of the angels, it, uh, the fathers actually like like Basil and the Hexameron actually refer to it as eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, the eternity of the angels is different from our experience of time. Um, and it is um, the way that they participate in divine eternity. So you have sort of two different levels of eternity. You have eternity as the divine procession that's... Uh, characteristic of God himself. And then you have the way that creatures can participate in divine eternity, namely this angelic, ever increasing good. Um, and, and Gregory thinks that in the, in the afterlife and beatitude, we too will have that same experience of eternity, uh, as you might say, participated eternity. Um, and for what it's worth, just a little footnote, um, in the West, this leads to the concept of what's called the Avum, A-E-V-U-M, mm -hmm. 
which was a Latin word created by transliterating the word ion, uh, A-I-O-N from Greek. And uh, I talk about in the longer paper how that really came about because um, John Saracen, who translated the divine names into Latin in the, in the 12th century, he used uh, different terms to translate avum or ion rather in different places. And it gets kind of confusing. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of creates through his Latin translation, this different concept that's actually not quite there in the Greek fathers. Anyway, that's a little digression, um, but it's, it's what becomes pretty significant in Western scholasticism. Um, but for the Greek fathers, the eternity of the angels is really very simple. It's the way that creatures participate in divine eternity. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing that Basil says in the Hexameron is that time is the image of that participated eternity. It's the image of the eternity of the angels. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where he is kind of adapting that idea from Plato of time being the moving image of eternity. He actually says, yeah, it's the image of the eternity of the angels. Mm -hmm. And he um, applies that, you know, in the Septuagint, um, the creation account in Genesis 1, where it says, uh, and the evening and the morning were the first day. In the Septuagint, it actually is a little different. It says, and the evening and the morning were one day. And he sees a lot of significance in that. He thinks that what that's indicating is that that first day of creation, which was, of course, a Sunday, already was, in a sense, the fullness of time as an image of eternity. And Sunday is sort of the day that is uniquely the image of eternity. Uh, and they cr they connect this to the idea of the eighth day uh, that uh, is very prominent in the fathers. The eighth day being eternity itself. I mean, the eternity that we enter into, uh, which is, uh, like I was saying, uh, a participation in the divine eternity. But that's what time itself is an image of. And, you know, like Basil in his... Um, uh, I quote a passage where he's talking about, so this is why we stand to pray on Sunday. Uh, it's not just because it's the day of the resurrection. It's because the day, it's the day that is the image of, of our participating in divine eternity. Um, so anyway, all that's true of the, the eternity of the angels. Um, now for what it's worth about the demons, I, you know, I suspect uh, Father Stanilo is, is, is right about this, that the demons by rejecting communion they're rejecting eternity. They're rejecting the the possibility of participating in the divine life. Um, but they don't cease to exist. They instead enter into, uh, I, I, and maybe I'm, I, you know, I haven't finished his article, right? So maybe a little off on this, but it seems to me what they're doing is they're entering into a, a sort of bare time, time that has no, no, no further potentiality of participating in eternity right. of becoming the arena in which that takes place. Um, and so it's, it's bare, it's nude. It's, uh, it's, uh, without any further capacity, uh, to, uh, uh for communion in something higher. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's another name for damnation. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I have an article that's online, actually, it's called, uh, facing hard questions about salvation. Hmm where I asked this question about eternal damnation, how should we think about that? You know, a lot of people want to be universalists because they think it's just unthinkable. God would allow this. Um, but it's, it's part of freedom to have the freedom to reject. Um, and I, I picture it as kind of asymptotic in the sense that it's an ever diminishing state of being because as you turn away from God, you're turning away from being. And you're making yourself something less and less and less uh, with, each, with each step. But it's asymptotic because it's approaching zero, but it, but it's also unending because it never quite reaches zero. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if Father Stanilo goes that far, but um, at any rate, I, I think he is he's definitely right to distinguish very sharply the way the, the demons experience temporality from the way the angels experience eternity. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think he would say he would basically agree with everything you said there, even if he doesn't say it um, explicitly. But I, I think he, he basically does. Um, and one thing I'm not sure if he has said this, but just uh, just now that we're on this topic, um, um, maybe maybe if um, you have any thoughts on this, um, 
I forgot where I heard it from. Um, but basically, because the demons um, have have performed this absolute withdra- withdrawal from communion, we can say. Um, I've heard that one way we can understand, or maybe this is like more speculative, but the way demons still have not reached this absolute level, even though they have, they're like in the Orthodox tradition, we don't really believe there's hope for demons um, uh, to be saved typically. Um, and even though we, there are still demons acting in time, like acting in creation. Um, and one of the ways this was explained to me as, as one possible answer to this, the fact that demons have not reached the absolute level of damnation or, or withdrawal away from communion, but also subjectively they have already decided on their fate, is because as they were basically fell from heaven into creation, they are now participating in creation in this unholy union, um, basically um, leeching off of the energies of creation to continue until the coming of Christ, where he reclaims all of creation and takes away their ability to um, to uh, to basically um, use creation in this uh, way that ultimately destroys creation and destroys themselves because um, cre- creation and being only exists in communion, as as you were saying, God is as communion with God is how we all have being. But if you're using being in a way that um, rejects communion, turns away from communion, this is like a self negating a self negating action. And so for the demons, they're pushed out of heaven and into creation creation. And it's basically the story of Christianity is how Christ, after his ascension to heaven, he's ruling, ruling earth um, from heaven at the right hand of his father. He, they're slowly the um, Christ is slowly taking back creation and demons. The demons are being forced further and further up until the point where um, they're cast into the abyss, the abyss and completely um, outside of creation. So basically the idea is that even though, um, the demons have fallen into this um eternity of of uh what Sanila calls like a constant repetition inability to self transcend to move towards anything other than the the bare now um they have it there is a sense in which they still participate in in, in time precisely through this um this false participation unholy participation in creation that they are um, able to do until the eschaton. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you see any any value in that in that understanding, but um, I, I find it quite interesting. Maybe like a speculative understanding of of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to think about exactly what that would mean. I mean, is he saying that um, at the last judgment, then when they're cast into the lake of fire, uh, that from that point there's no longer any sequential experience for right. the demons. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about that because it seems to me like the way that scripture speaks about damnation, it is something where the experience continues. You know, uh, mm-hmm. Christ says that uh, the, their worm does not die and the fire right. is not quenched. Um, and even the image of the lake of fire seems to be pointing to something they'll continue to experience. Mm-hmm. Um, whether we want to call that time or not, I don't know. Um, and uh, in that paper of my own, that I mentioned, I, I, I speculate too. I, I speculate maybe their consciousness becomes so fragmentary uh, in that diminishment of being uh, as they their powers of, of reason and of awareness themselves are sort of dissolving that uh, they don't have much connected memory, you know, much ability to even understand anymore and all they have is the bare awareness uh, from moment to moment mm-hmm. of, of of pain or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, uh, but that's speculation too. So I'm, yeah. I never want to assert as if I think we can know these things that are not revealed. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think you're right that um, well, the demons now in their current state are parasitic. Yeah. On the goodness of creation and... Uh, Dionysius talks about this in that chapter four of the divine names. The whole latter half of chapter four is his treatment of evil, evil as a kind of privation of goodness. And he has quite a lot to say about the demons and how um, the demons, insofar as they have being, they're good. 
everything that God made is good and in everything as far as it has being is good. And um, they still have a capacity for desire, but he says um, their desire is conflicted or sort of incomplete because true desire is always for the good, that is God. And so he says that the, the, the desire of the demons for sin is sort of not so much uh, desire itself as a kind of a failure of desire. Um, so he sees that fragmentation of being already taking place. Um, so, yeah, I think um, that's sort of the place to start, you know, that second half of chapter four in the divine names to understand what the fathers teach about the demons. And of course, Father Stanlow, I know that text really knew that text really well. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the inspiration for um, at least some of what he's saying. Right. Right. Um, well, a different topic um that we could t touch on, which uh, you also talk about, and it's related to the idea of time as um, an icon of eternity. And that's the way sort of, um, I guess the liturgical cycle would fit into this. And also the, 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 the week, the, the way the week uh, sort of revolves back around on itself and what the fathers have to say. And I think it's um, um, one thing that I've, I've noticed when reading um, the, the classical, philosophers like the ancient greek philosophers and you find this in the far east as well their understanding of time typically seems to be this like circular movement and um and then it's funny when you um look at modernity our understanding of time typically seems to be not circular movement like an unending circle but an unending line like this non-teleological movement towards just pure progress, like pure technological progress, pure economic progress, social progress, all of this stuff. Um, and progress in modernity doesn't really have any any end. There's nothing concrete that we're really striving towards. You can just always move further and further and further. And I think you're seeing this with our um, our cu culture right now. And, and there's a similar like there's a similar uh, there's a similarity here with the ancient Greek time, which is sort of um, non messianic time and non-christian time where there there's like a circle circle but there's also no real telos to that in the sense of this creative movement some to something else it's just repetition and um and then in christianity i think they there's um elements of both modernity and um the classical world because as you were saying there's um like this circle of the liturgical liturgical cycle for example we we do this um we do the liturgy every single week over and over and over again, but also the liturgy itself points towards the eighth day. It points towards, um, um, and it, and yeah, there's always a sense in which also in the individual Christian's life and the life of the church as a whole, we are striving in this movement, this repetition of the liturgy each week, we try and become closer and closer with God. So there's not like a pure um, progress in modernity with no real telos, and nor is it just the circular movement that you find in the Far East and in the ancient Greek world. Um, and I like this sort of analogy, you, you, you were using the analogy of the of the line as well, sort of in a, in a different way than I was using it with modernity to talk about angelic time. But I'm just, yeah, maybe you could... Um, get into this idea of of how we understand time as an image of eternity and how it relates to the life of the church and the liturgical cycle and what the fathers have to say about that because i'm i'm sure they had um i'm sure they had some interesting things to say about that yeah well you what you just said i thought was very good that um it is true that ancient cultures generally did have a more cyclical view of time mm -hmm. uh basically deriving from the stars, observing the stars and their cyclical motions. Um, one, one book I like that talks about this is called uh, The Gifts of the Jews by Thomas Cahill. And he draws the contrast between Babylonia and uh, the Jews beginning with Abraham. And he puts it in terms of uh, he, he, his images. He said, I think the title of the chapters are the wheel, that's the chapter on Babylonia, and the journey, that's the chapter on Abraham. Because God calls Abraham out from Babylonia, um, and that summons is open-ended, right? God doesn't tell him where, <laughs> where he's going to go or what he's going to do. And his whole life then from that point is a life of faith 
because he has to respond to God's summons, not knowing where it's going to lead him or what's going to be required of him. Um, and so it's not only a different way of thinking about time, it's also a different way of thinking about God and our relationship to God in which faith becomes central in a way that it wasn't for the Babylonians or the Egyptians or any other ancient culture. Um, now that doesn't mean that therefore the cyclical, cyclical pattern uh, of time that, that's sort of embedded in the heavens um, isn't important, it is, but the fathers, um, uh, they, they, they sort of do justice, you might say to both sides of this because uh, St. Basil and the Hexameron um, he says that, uh, yeah, eternity, the eternity of the angels is this sort of cyclical, it's, it's, you know, I mentioned earlier, sort of an ever growing ray that's true in terms of their experience, but you could also say it's, it has the perfect wholeness mm -hmm. of circular movement. You know, that's the image going back, Plato and Aristotle talk about this, that cyclical movement is the kind of movement that's nearest to the fullness of the divine because it has no beginning or ending place. It has no point of discontinuity. Um, and so um, he says that's true of the eternity of the angels. And that's why uh, that first day, the Sunday, the first day of creation is the image of that angelic eternity. And, you know, like I mentioned, that's why we stand to pray on Sunday. Um, and the eighth day um, is then the image or, or sort of a name for, or rather a name for eternity itself. Um, there's another passage in St. Gregory the Theologian that I quote in the longer paper um, in which he talks about the ancient practice that when people were baptized on Holy Saturday, they then wore those white robes at baptism um, for the next eight days, counting mm -hmm. from Holy Saturday itself, which is until the Sunday after Easter or after Pascha. And um, so that's the eighth day. And what he describes is that and on that day, they remove the robes of baptism to symbolize their entrance into eternity. Um, and so uh, that's another example of how our liturgical worship in orthodoxy is sort of um, founded on this basic conception of time as an image of eternity and at the things we do in time as a way of partaking in that uh, eternity that God is offering, that sort of inviting us into. And of course, in the liturgy, that's also expressed in the Cherubic hymn. We who mystically represent the cherubim and who sing the thrice holy hymn, holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, to the life-giving trinity. Well, that's the hymn that the angels are singing in Isaiah 6, right. uh, the seraphim. So um uh the liturgy itself is a way that we participate in the eternal worship of the angels around the throne of god um that's also i think you know in, in revelation and in those early chapters of revelation you see that as well how uh the blessed in heaven are singing that hymn holy 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 lord god of sabaoth um and so um all of that's the sort of the premise of the whole liturgy and, and, mm -hmm. and the whole order of worship is that it's not just something we're doing in time. It's also a way of sort of initiating us into that, that eternal life. Um, so I hope is that, I guess that's kind of what you're asking about. Yeah. That yeah. That was great. Um, one thing, um, that you, that you mentioned, which I think is a great point. Um, I'm not sure if you'll have anything to say on this, but I just want to note, um, uh, what you were saying about faith and sort of how Abraham was, um, he, he lived a life of faith because he didn't really know where he was ultimately being led and, um, or what his goal was. And I think it's the same thing with us in a, in a different way, but like, um, we could talk about this individually, like in our life, the life of the Christian, we don't know when we're going to, when we're going to die and when we're going to meet, meet Jesus, but we, um, uh, we still live with this faith towards God and we live, um, with a fundamental not knowing, I guess. And I think that sort of not knowing is perhaps constitutive of, of time before it enters into eternity. It's this sort of um, anticipation. That's really what time is. And for the Christian time should be this, um, 
movement closer and closer towards what we are anticipating and towards what we have faith and hope in. And I think, and I think with the liturgy as well, there's this sort of like um, the church as a whole, we don't know when Christ will come. We don't know um, when eternity will truly unite with time, but nonetheless, we have this faith and this orientation towards eternity. Um, and I, th and I think, yeah, I guess that would be the fundamental fundamentally unique thing about a Christian's experience of time. And you, and you mentioned this in your paper about how the, um, the Greek uh, patristic understanding of time isn't just uh, uh, important for philosophy and theology, but it has uh, fundamental uh, importance for um, the understanding of our spirituality in our life as Christians. Um, and I think that this sort of time where eternity and time aren't just completely separated, but time as an icon of eternity and time as requiring this faith in this openness towards eternity. Um, yeah, I, I think this is like a, the, the, this is basically the essence of, of Christian spirituality and, and Christian, the Christian experience of time, which is this faithful and hopeful orientation towards eternity, despite not truly knowing, um, knowing what eternity is. Um, but, uh, yeah, nonetheless, there's that openness towards it. Yeah. 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 I, I couldn't agree more. I think, and one way you can see what's so distinctive about the Christian approach or understanding is how when it becomes secularized, which is what does happen in Western philosophy, um, with the rise of the idea of progress, as you mentioned, you know, that's progress is sort of the secular analog to Christian belief in mm -hmm. the eschaton. Mm -hmm. um, and you look at something like Marxism. It has uh, an idea of a future paradise without God. Right. Okay. Yeah. A future paradise that will create on our own using technology. And um, because that paradise is the highest good or the only thing ultimately worth striving for, any means are, are justified in order to achieve it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens is as the Christian idea is secularized, the moral framework, the idea of what virtue is, for instance, is inverted. Um, so that whereas Christians have an attitude of faith and trust in God to uh, bring us to that ultimate consummation in the way that that's pleasing to him in his own time, according to his own will, and we, we simply seek to be responsive to his will, for someone like the Marxists or a lot of other secular ideologies, uh, that eschaton is something we bring about mm -hmm. through our uh, political action. And there's no room for faith and there's really no, no room either for humility. Um, that's another thing you see, you know, when you look at modern politics is um, how people think that by, you know, their politics has become their religion. It's become um, the means by which they're going to bring about salvation and the, the ultimate end or good that they're seeking and therefore uh, all means are justified um and so uh it becomes demonic it really does that's what you know chesterton has a comment somewhere about how um uh when you lose god the virtues themselves become evil <laughs> it's it's sort of yeah you know they're set loose on their own they become demon a form, kind of demonic frenzy because there's no longer god who is himself the highest good mm -hmm. uh the good you know the good with a capital g without that everything else has no coherence and uh, uh even seeking things you think are good become uh, ways of doing evil so it's very dangerous and uh, uh i think you can learn a lot from the history of philosophy seeing how philosophy has taken what ideas that were originally good and holy and has perverted them. Um, and, you know, we're living with the result. Yeah. Well, well said. Um, and, and with that, that's basically, um, all of all the topics I wanted to uh, touch on with this. Uh, I really, uh, appreciated your time and I thought this was a great conversation. Um, but before we go, um, do you happen to have any, are you working on anything? Is there any new projects in, in, in the making at the moment? Oh, I'm working on many things. I'm too many, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, let's see. So the the main project, um, trying to remember, I guess this is the main one. I mean, I am doing several others, but um, 
there's a little, there's a series of books that Cambridge University Press is putting out these days called Elements. I don't know if you've seen, seen these, but there are already dozens of them out there uh, just in philosophy. They're uh, really short sort of summary treatments of key topics. And uh, I was asked to do one in a, in a series called The Problem of God um, that's on sort of topics in philosophy and theology. And they gave me the topic of the God of Eastern Orthodoxy, which I love. And yeah. no one has really done this before, but it's really, I think, well worth trying to do. Uh, these are limited to 30,000 words, so you've got to be concise. Hmm. But trying to, to explain uh, from a philosophical standpoint what's distinctive about the Orthodox view of God and how Orthodoxy would approach a lot of the, the central topics in philosophy of religion. All right. That's, uh, of course, as a philosopher, that's kind of so not really doing theology per se, doing more philosophy of religion from an orthodox standpoint. Hmm. Um, and uh, in a little longer term over the next few years, I do have a book I'm working on that's going to be, you know, beginning with Plato, beginning with ancient Greek philosophy, but then leading into the fathers, trying to see patristic theology in light of its roots in ancient Greek philosophy and understanding the continuity as well as the differences and really writing there, you know, partly for an audience of secular philosophers to show them how ancient Greek philosophy really finds its fulfillment in the thought of the fathers. And then also writing for an audience of Orthodox or people interested in patristic theology to help, help them understand how a lot of things in the fathers become a lot clearer when you see the, when you understand the philosophical sources. Um, but that's a longer term project, um, God willing, yeah. uh, maybe in the next few years. Nice. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's something to look forward to. Um, and yeah, so w sorry, when when do you think this book um, with Cambridge is going to be is going to be um, released? Yeah, well, the deadline is this summer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I need to get to work. I haven't started it yet. Oh. <laughs> uh, but it is short. So that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I can finish the summer, it'll be released, I think, within, uh, you know, six months. So maybe like nice. late this year, or early next year. Cool. cool. OK, well, um, yeah, again, I really appreciate your time. And um, I yeah, this was a, this is a very crucial topic. So I'm glad we got to um, I'm glad we got to discuss it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. Like this, like we said earlier, you know, it's it's so important for so many things. And it's not a topic that in books of Orthodox theology is usually discussed. And so mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate your taking mm -hmm. the time to, uh, to uh, invite me and to, to do this.